Who Paul Really Is Original Words by Neville Goddard And Revised and Edited by Alio If tonight I had a wish for you, I could not think of anything greater than to wish that you would now experience the story of Paul. I do not know if you have ever asked yourself, Who is Paul? Paul is not mentioned in any non-biblical work of the first century outside of the Bible, and yet he wrote so many letters, seemingly from jail, and they have been recorded. Yet there is no record of any Paul being in the jail, and certainly he would be recorded. So, who is Paul? Paul is that last state of consciousness that man must reach if he would experience the reality of God. You and I have ambitions in the world. Some want to be dictators, doctors, lawyers, scientists. All of these are in order. But there will come a time in the life of man when there will be a hunger sent upon him, as we are told in the book of Amos. It will not be a famine for bread or a thirst for water, but for the hearing of the word of God. Amos chapter 8 verse 11 And only an experience of God can satisfy this hunger. That is that state of consciousness called Paul. Only an experience of God can satisfy him. Not a thing in the world could satisfy him. So, if I wish this night that you would have the experience of Paul... I am wishing for you that you would have the experience of God, that that final hunger would be satisfied within you, that you would actually know the experience of the reality of God. At the very end of the book of Acts, when they tell the story of his end, they said that he expounded the matter to them from morning to evening, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. And some believed from what they had heard, while others disbelieved. Acts chapter 28 verses 23 and 24. That is the story. Some believe it, others disbelieve it. You will find this in every walk of life. Now, Paul is the one who started the movement, as it were. He found God's plan of salvation, and he called it a mystery. Paul uses the word mystery no less than 20 times. He tells us that it is a mystery. He speaks of it as a pattern, a pattern of words. When he writes his letter to Timothy, he said, Follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me. Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. He tells it in his letter to the Galatians, having spoken to the Galatians and explained the mystery of Christ. Then he says to them, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the truth of the Spirit by works of the law, or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Paul saw that the Godhead was veiled in flesh and blood, and so he could say, When it pleased God to reveal his Son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Galatians chapter 1, verse 16. The outer rational mind could not understand revealed truth, for revealed truth cannot be logically proven. So, to whom would I turn and ask them to throw light on my experience if my experience is not within the framework of the rational mind? If I tell you what I experienced, and there is not a thing that you can do about it on this level, then how would I turn to you or anyone in the world and ask for some light upon the experience? So, Having had the experience that only an experience of God could satisfy, he couldn't go to the rational mind, which he called flesh and blood. Now, when he uses the word Christ, remember the word Christ means Messiah. 
In the Old Testament, the word Christ is not used, but the word Messiah is. So Messiah was the promise. Now he said, Henceforth I regard no one from the human point of view, even though I once regarded. Now he used the word Christ. Now let's use the word Messiah. Even though I once regarded the Messiah from a human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 Having had the experience, he was not looking for any flesh and blood savior called Messiah. He experienced Messiah. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Now he said, I have been crucified with Christ, which means Messiah. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Messiah lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 1 verse 20 Now you put it all together, and I will try to unfold a certain pattern for you. Jesus is the pattern man. The pattern is hidden in man. And he asked the question in his letter to the Corinthians, Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you have failed to meet the test. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. I hope you realize that we have not failed in meeting the test. But I'll give you a quick test. Jesus Christ. Now what did you, at that moment, think? Something on the outside? Let me repeat it. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you have failed to meet the test. Now, Jesus Christ. What does the mind do? Go on the outside to some existence, something external to yourself? Then you have failed to meet the test. For Jesus Christ is in you. Now, that pattern has to unfold within you. It can't unfold within you as long as you have a concept of Jesus Christ as flesh and blood. Even in this morning's paper, I could hardly believe my eyes. Here is a new paper from the Vatican, giving new guidelines, but insisting on the tradition that must be kept. And the tradition that they mention is that the virginity of Mary must be sustained. Well, if you read the sixth chapter of the book of Mark, I don't see how anyone with a brain in his head could sustain that story, if you take it as secular history. If you aren't familiar with the sixth chapter of the book of Mark, let me quote it for you. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph, and Simon and Judah, and are not his sisters, it's plural, here with us? Mark chapter 6 verse 3. So, They mention a minimum of six members of his family, four brothers and at least two sisters, with himself as the seventh. And now I must look upon this as secular history and say that the mother of the brood remains the virgin? But they omit the six that are mentioned and say she only had one, and justify it by saying that Joseph had these others by some other woman. That is not mentioned in scripture at all. Now, I'm called upon by today's directive to admit that the Pope is infallible. Well, now, that is the height of nonsense. Just complete, silly nonsense. I don't care what you have had as a background in religion. That statement is stupid. Religion has not a thing. True religion hasn't a thing to do with secular history. It is salvation history. The whole thing unfolds in you. It's all about you. It takes place within your own wonderful skull. That's where it takes place. The being spoken of as the Lord in the Bible is your own wonderful I am. That's God. Your own wonderful human imagination. That is the Lord. One day, when you get rid of some physical Christ, some physical being external to yourself, you make room for the stirring of this pattern within you. And the pattern unfolds within you. Paul said, I refuse to admit anyone but Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2 You hear the word crucified and you think of some cruel act, don't you? It isn't. 
let me share with you my experience of the crucifixion. It is sheer bliss. The 42nd chapter of Psalms, or the 42nd Psalm if you prefer, tells the story of remembrance. And these things I remember. Psalm chapter 42 verse 4. And now he recites what he remembers. How he went with the throng and led them in procession to a house of God. It was a gay and happy crowd. That night I led them in procession to the house of God. They were all together, I would say, thrilled beyond measure because we are leading to the house of God. A voice rang out as I led them, and the voice said, and God walks with them. A woman at my side, to my right, she answered the voice, and she said, If God walks with us, where is he? And the voice replied, At your side. She turned to her left, looked into my face, and then she said, What? Is Neville God? And the voice replied, Yes, in the act of waking. Then the voice said to me, and to me only, it came from the very depths of my being, I laid myself down within you to sleep, and as I slept, I dreamt a dream. I dreamed, and I knew exactly what he was dreaming. He was dreaming that he is I. I also knew that when he woke from his dream, I am he. The two would cease to be two, and they would become one. He is dreaming my life until he awakens within me. But when he awakens within me, he is not another. He awakes as the being in whom he fell asleep, whose life he is dreaming. That I did know. And then this happened. I felt myself move quickly from this wonderful crowd moving towards the seeming house of God, and then suddenly I am nailed upon this body with these six vortices. My head is a vortex. My two hands are vortices. My right side is a vortex. And my two feet, the soles of my feet, are vortices. And I tell you, it is sheer ecstasy. That's the crucifixion. That is when God crucified himself upon this cross called man of flesh and blood. Well, no one can attain to bliss unless he is generated here on earth. So you and I am here. And God deliberately laid himself down within us to dream our lives. And he's dreaming that he is you. And one day he will awaken. And he is you. And you are God. Without loss of identity. I will know you just as I know you now, but you will be raised to the ninth degree of beauty. I can't quite find the words to describe the majesty and the dignity and all that is wonderful concerning you. And yet, I will know you as God. I will know you as Jim, whom I know and love as a friend, and I will still know Jimmy as God. That is the destiny for everyone in this world. So, you can forget the historical presentation of scripture as organized churches keep it and maintain it. Paul made the statement in his famous 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians called, Him in praise of love, the hymn of love. He said, When I was a child, I thought like a child, I spoke like a child, I reasoned like a child. But, when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 Verse 11. When you mature spiritually, you give up these childish ways that insist on the historical presentation of Jesus and the secular history of the Bible. And that pattern will unfold when that child becomes a man. He stops accepting the flesh and blood Jesus and sees him for what he is. It's a pattern that unfolds within a man as the man within unfolds. And it begins with the resurrection. The crucifixion is over for all of us. Everyone has been crucified with Christ on these garments called the cross. The day will come, and it starts with the resurrection. You will rise within yourself, followed instantly by your birth from above. For no man can enter that state called the kingdom of God unless he is born from above. So, he spent his days from morning to evening testifying to the kingdom of God, and trying to convince them about Jesus. Then he used as his arguments the law of Moses, reading scripture for them, 
and then the prophets and the Psalms, trying to show these passages paralleled his own experience. What passage would parallel his experience when it pleased God to reveal his son in me? And the preposition is in. It's not to me, as some translators give it. When it pleased God to reveal his son in me, Galatians chapter 1 verse 16, that's where he is revealed. Suddenly within you the son appears, and the son is just as told you in the scripture, the second psalm. And I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said unto me, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. Psalm chapter 2 verse 7 Whose words are these? These are the words of the psalmist, David. So, when he reveals his son in you, which is called Messiah, it is David. Then you know who you are, because he is telling of the decree of the Lord. God said unto David, Thou art my son. Well, if David now stands before you and calls you father, who are you? Are you not God? Are you not the Lord? Well, I prophesy for you, you will have it. You will have that experience where David stands before you and calls you father. Then, and then only, you will know that you are the Lord God. All these things are going to happen to every child born of woman. How do I know when? Let me share with you an experience. I do not think the lady is here tonight. She has been coming here recently, and she wrote me a letter wherein she said, I did not understand your books. They were given recently to me by a lady who brought me to your meetings. I've only been coming to your meetings recently, and I will come, I think, until the end. Well, they are not here tonight, but I will tell the story. She said, The night before last, and her letter is dated the 11th of June, so this is the 9th of June. In my dream, I found myself standing on the corner waiting for a streetcar or a bus, and they came by, and the crowds got on, and I let everyone go by. And I wondered to myself, if across the way, from the apartment house, someone is seeing me standing here, they will wonder, what's wrong with that woman? She could have boarded one of these buses to take her to her destination. And here I am, waiting. Then a woman came to me and said, The train you are waiting for will be here in a minute. It's a black train. A long, flat, black train, with seats on both sides facing the street. I looked up, and here was a long, black train coming, with seats on both sides facing the street. I boarded it. Up front I saw a crowd around a coffin. The coffin was covered, and they were weeping, and my attention was drawn to the coffin. Then it was diverted, because I looked to the street, and here was a young woman dead, very dead. Her right arm was eaten away up to the shoulder, and she truly was dead as she laid there. Then I noticed the feet begin to move, and this woman began to be, I would say, restored to life. This young woman. Then my attention was turned now to the coffin, and out of the coffin rises a man clothed in white. At that moment I awoke and remained awake long enough to record it and to impress my mind with the dream. I went back to sleep, and here I am among a huge crowd. We are all going to hear Neville, but there is a feeling in the atmosphere that Neville is about to die, and we hastened our pace because we wanted to be with him if he's about to die. So Neville puts a robe upon him, and he lays down in a ditch. And then he crawls through a small tunnel, but it seemed so easy for him to do it. He crawled through the tunnel which led him into a cave, and when he entered the cave, he stretched himself out in the cave, and all of us struggled to follow the same pattern. So we too crawled through this tube, and it was a very great struggle on our part. It was not as easy as you made it seem. It seemed so effortless when you did it. Then you rose from the cave as though you had a change of mind, and you came back out the same way with the same effortlessness. As you came out, we made the same effort. Again, I wondered, whoever made this, why could they not have made it easier? And so we all came out, but not everyone could make it. Many of us did, but not all could make it. 
I will tell you, all will make it, but all are not ready to make it. That was an adumbration. That was a foreshadowing of what is in store for everyone in this world. This is the mystery of life through death. Unless a seed, or the grain of wheat, falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much. So God dies, literally dies. God became as I am, that I may be as he is. He can't pretend that he is Neville. He has to actually become me. And therefore, in becoming me, he died. He is buried in my skull. That's where he is buried. And the day will come. I will awaken, as I have awakened in my skull and come out through that tube, that very small opening. I pushed my way out to discover the entire drama unfolding before me. So, I say to you, you are immortal. You know why? Because you are God. God actually became as you are, and he cannot fail. For if today it is said of Paul, he tried to convince them about Jesus, and some believed from what he said, while others disbelieved. Those who disbelieved are only disbelieving for a while. They are still children. They can't get out of their minds the historical presentation of Scripture. They must hold on like a child to some little thing that they can put their hands upon and touch it and see a physical Jesus on the outside. The day will come when man will set aside the historical views of Scripture. Then the pattern can stir within, and the pattern will unfold itself within man. And everything said of Jesus in Scripture, he or she is going to experience in the first person singular, present tense experience. Then he or she will know who Jesus is, for the whole pattern will unfold within them. He will tell it to the best of his ability. I thought I told it clearly in my books. Evidently to this lady I didn't, for she said, The books were given to me, and I read them, but I did not get them. Having attended a few of your lectures only recently, I now begin to understand the books, but not until I heard you speak from the platform. Well, that was quite a shock, because I thought the books were simply written, and I still do. I couldn't quite see how she could not grasp them. But by her own confession, she could not grasp it until she heard me. So, here I am telling it from the platform and trying to tell it also in books. And some believe it, and some disbelieve it. Some will think this whole thing is simply sacrilegious, that I am trying to take from them their gods. I am trying to take from them their false gods, the god that does not exist. I am trying to take that god from them, that the real God can begin to stir within them and unfold in them, as them. Because until the false God disappears, the real God cannot awaken within you. And as long as you have a Christ Jesus of flesh and blood, you do not know Christ Jesus. Listen to the words again. Henceforth I regard no one from the human point of view. Even though I once regarded Christ from the human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. These are the words of Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. I am crucified with Christ, said he. Nevertheless I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Well, I am telling you, your real being is Jesus. That's the Lord. Your real son is David. That's the Messiah. But you do not know that you are the Lord and cannot know it until your son appears. The day will come. He will appear. And the minute he appears, you will know exactly who he is. There will be no uncertainty as to this relationship between you, the father, and David, the son. It takes the son to reveal the father.
Now, no church in this land that I know of is teaching this, so I have been sent to tell it to you. And you are here a small audience, but what does it matter? A small audience started on the truth can spread to the whole vast world. I am telling you what I know from experience. I am not theorizing. I am not speculating. You are the Lord suffering from amnesia because you have forgotten who you are. That's how complete your gift was when you became man. And the day will come. You will awaken and remember who you are. And because you are God the Father, there must be a son to bear witness to your fatherhood. And that son is David. Then you will know who you are. Then, one by one, we will reunite into the one being who is God the Father, without loss of our individuality, without the loss of the being that we are. I will know you in eternity, but know you as God. Now, here we only have two lectures left, and these will be in order, even though they seem repetitious. They cannot be repeated too often. Man so quickly forgets. You go away for a month, and those you thought really understood you when you return, they try to tell you, I just found the most wonderful book on diets, or the most wonderful book on how to get into heaven in another way. A friend of mine, I thought he understood it. I thought he did, for he made extravagant claims, and in the last month he sent me books by men that I knew before they died here. We mustn't judge from appearances, I know. But as I told him over the phone when I sent the books back, I had the dubious pleasure of knowing these men. The book that you just sent me, that man is incapable of writing a decent sentence. I knew him when he sold stocks that did not exist, and there is no transforming power in death. He is still selling stocks that do not exist, and you ask me to read this book? I wouldn't trust him as far as I could throw him. I am not an exceptionally strong man today, and he weighed, when he died, over 200 pounds, so you can see how far I would trust him. And I thought that man really understood what I'm talking about. I'd believed that he did. That's how deceived you can be when you think that they understand you and they go away for a short while, maybe a year, and then they completely forget the message. You could tell them over and over that your own wonderful human imagination is God, and there is no other God, and don't start looking for another God, and that God is forever. His name is I Am, forever and forever. And you can't leave it alone. That's the Lord. But he's a father, and I tell you from experience, his son is David. I thought he understood it, because he told me one day that he had an experience. Well, I know it was an adumbration. It was a foreshadowing. He is a very powerful thinker, so he could conjure and give himself a grand hallucination and thought that was it. It wasn't it. That was a hallucination, what he thought, because it doesn't come that way. The dove does not come the way that he told me it came to him. It doesn't come that way. The whole heavens becomes translucent when he comes, and the dove floats just as though it is floating on water, but it's translucent. The action of the dove is without effort, therefore it must be floating. Then it descends gently upon you, and then you, like Noah, you stretch out your hand for it, and the dove lights upon your hand just as you are told in the book of Genesis, and you bring the dove to you. Then the dove smothers you with kisses. But the other is a wonderful adumbration. It's a wonderful forecasting. But then, I thought that would be encouraging to him to have the adumbration to sustain him until the reality takes place. Evidently not. That is why I have to repeat it over and over and over once more, that you won't forget it. So, when he wrote his last letter to Timothy, but Timothy was then a man of God, he was no longer a child, for he is called a man of God. Only two are called men of God in Scripture. One is Moses, and one is Timothy. 
and so he speaks to the man of God, but he still has to remind him to follow the pattern of the sound words which you have heard from me. Guard the truth that has been entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Guard it. Don't let anything come in and take from you that truth, for there is only one true way to God, only one living and true way to the Father, and it's that pattern. The pattern unfolds within you. That pattern is called in Scripture, Jesus Christ, or the Lord and His Christ. That is what it is called. And when it unfolds within you, you are the Lord, and you have a Messiah. He stands before you, and he is David. Now, I could close my eyes at this very moment in confidence that everyone is going to experience this. I only hope you will not be diverted in the interval. I hope that you will actually believe what I have told you, but I know you are going to have it. And it's not anything that you saw in this morning's paper if you read what I read. I am Mary, and you can say that too. I am Mary, and birth to God must give if I in blessedness for now and ever more would live. There is no other Mary. That holy womb is my own skull. That's the cave that the lady saw. And you go into that cave deliberately voluntarily, may I tell you? And you die in your dream that you are other than who you are, because you are God dreaming that you are John, that you are Neville, that you are Sasha, that you are Jan. You are dreaming these, and when your dream is over, you are. You have individualized yourself as Jimmy, as Sasha, everyone in the world, and only God then awakes. And when God awakes, we are individualized and we are God. So, the true temple of God is the individuality of man, made perfect by the Holy Spirit within us. He comes within us, and we are made perfect. We then, the individualized man, is the true temple of God. So, I will meet you, yes, you, in eternity. And you will know me. A lady is here tonight who wrote me a letter this past week. She said, Neville, I was sitting in my living room. My husband had a toothache, and he retired. I thought, well, I would just sit and meditate. I was meditating in my living room, and suddenly I felt the presence of God. I looked up, and there in my dining room, there you were. And I knew you were Neville, but I also knew you were God. There was no uncertainty in my mind. I am looking at you. This is the Neville that I know, yet I know you are God. And you are clothed in light, golden light. And then I must tell you, she said at the very end, you were altogether beautiful. Well, thank you, my dear. <laughs> I do know that when you see the being that you really are, no human words can describe that beauty. No human words can describe the majesty that is yours, the strength that is yours, the character that is yours. And through these mortal eyes, you can look into any mirror and you could never think that eternity is long enough to bring you to that state. And yet, when it takes place, instantaneously you are that being. So she saw it, as many have seen it and many will see it until I depart this world. And then many will see it after I depart this world, for I know what I'm talking about. The whole story as told in the scripture unfolded itself in me, and I am relating my own experience. I am not speculating. I am not theorizing. I am telling you exactly what happened to me. And if this lady witnessed what I've told you that I am, all well and good. You are told in scripture that he appeared first to Peter. Well, I did. She isn't called Peter here. Then to the twelve. I did. Then to five hundred. I have not heard from five hundred, but I am hearing from them. Then to James. Then to the apostles. And last, as to one untimely born, he appeared also 
to Paul. Well, that is the last stage, when that one comes. Eventually it is going to unfold in him. But in her case who sits here tonight, she has qualified for the highest office. For as you are told in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians, when they questioned him concerning his apostleship, he said, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the Lord Jesus? He placed it as an indispensable prerequisite for apostleship, to have seen the risen Lord, for he confessed that he never saw any Jesus after the flesh. He never saw any Jesus after the flesh, nor did he ever, he said. Henceforth, I regard no one from the human point of view. Even though I once regarded Christ from the human point of view, I regard him thus no longer. So he saw him, but not after the flesh. Well, this thing talking to you here is simply a veil. The Godhead is veiled in flesh and blood, and you see the flesh. The lady saw that which is veiled, and that's what I am talking about. Your present garment veils the being that you are, and the being that you really are is God, and there is nothing but God. But while we wear it, and still are children, well then, as a child, I think as a child, and I reason as a child, and I talk as a child. But when we become men, we give up childish ways. So we can actually think abstractly, and not have to take this wonderful pattern and clothe it in flesh in order to understand it. So, when he speaks of the mystery, he said, Christ in you is the mystery of which I speak. That is the hope of glory. I tell you a mystery, he said. And twenty times he uses the word mystery. And the churches speak of Paul's martyrdom. The Bible, you can scour the Bible from beginning to end, and you will not find one word in scripture concerning any martyrdom of Paul. Yet the churches teach that he was martyred, that maybe he was fed to the lions by Nero. It hasn't a thing to do with that. The word martyr and the word witness are one and the same in scripture. So, he is a witness to the truth. But now, because the word witness was translated as martyr, they say he was a martyr. The word is martyr, but the translation, the meaning of the word, is witness. He said, I have come to bear witness to the truth when he stands before the judge and declares that his kingdom is not of this world. For this I was born, for this I have come into the world. For what purpose? To bear witness to the truth. That word translated as witness is the same word as martyr. I have come to bear witness to the truth. And they claim he was murdered? No. I tell you what I have told you earlier tonight. I have experienced crucifixion as Paul said he did, and it is ecstasy, sheer ecstasy. Six vortices, whirling vortices, a vortex, a vortex, a vortex, a vortex, and then the two feet are vortices, and I can't tell you the thrill when you are drawn into this body through these six vortices. And then the voice rings out, I laid myself down within you to sleep, and as I slept, I dreamt a dream. I dreamt. Yes, I knew exactly what he is dreaming. He is dreaming that he is I, and when he awakens, I am he. The two shall become one. For here was his emanation, yet his wife, till the sleep of death is past. And when that sleep of death is over and he awakes, he awakes in me as the being in whom he fell asleep. And I am he. Because he was a father when he laid himself down within me, when he wakes, he is still a father. Therefore, I am a father. So, he became me. And therefore, that son that was his son is now my son. And his son is David. And David calls me father. That is the mystery. You dwell upon it. You will be tempted to go astray and follow after strange gods, but stick to it. I have told you what I know, 
And so, if you are tempted, come back to it. As often as you are led astray, come back to it. Try to remember what I have told you, but don't turn away. I plead with you because I am telling you what is in store for you. Joy beyond measure. For we are all destined to enter that kingdom called the kingdom of God.